Welcome back for the second episode of Minds Behind Maps. I'm Maxim Letterman, and this is the second episode in this experiment I'm trying out, where I want to sit down with people who are creating and using anything geospatial to try to understand more about the field and the people in it. This time, I got to sit down with Will Cadell, the CEO and founder of Spark Geo, a company doing consulting across many fronts in geospatial for various industries. Will has also been writing his thoughts about the geospatial field for a while now, which I wanted to ask him about. And I also wanted to know a bit more about how he got to where he is now and how he is leading Spark Geo. In this conversation, we talk about the path that Will has taken that led him to creating Spark Geo and growing to where it is now through a changing landscape of technology, but also the types of problem that geospatial can help solve today while touching on the paradox between having so many problems to tackle and yet having to choose one. We also touch about the ever-changing technology enabling more and more data to be used with the different value propositions that come around that, as well as talk a bit about open source. This was really a great conversation. I try to prepare these, but I'm really thrilled to see that the conversation just end up going all over the place. I tend to believe that taking the time to sit down and have a conversation with someone is a great way to get to know them and understand that person a little bit better. At least I came out of this learning a bunch. I hope you find this interesting, or at the very least, entertaining. Part of me is still actually a bit surprised of the welcome this has received so far. So if you feel like it, please feel free to drop me an email, or even better, on Twitter, where I'm a bit more active, on at Max Lenormand. Will and SparkGeo are doing some pretty neat stuff that you might want to follow as well. I'll put links to everything we talk about in the show notes. In the meantime, here's my conversation with Will Cadell. Thanks for, for being here, um, Will. I, I like to, uh, I, I did this last time, so I'm going to try to reiterate here. I would like to know if you could tell me how you would describe yourself. Um, I am... I'm, I, I, I run a company called Spark Geo. I I'm kind of a reluctant entrepreneur. Um, I started Spark Geo, what, 10 years ago um, uh, to put maps on the internet, largely, but mainly to do something other than what I was doing. And, um, and yeah, uh, since then, we're largely doing the same thing, but just on a, on a uh, bigger scale, more people, more stuff, bigger problems, uh, but still maps, internet as, as key uh, features of our business. Could you actually tell me like how, how Spark Geo got started? You said like that was 10 years ago. Can, can you like walk me through like how that got started? Why you got started on, on that project? Yeah, it, yeah, it's a, uh, so I, uh, I studied in Aberdeen. I did an engineering, engineering degree, electronic engineering. Then I did uh, a master's in remote sensing. I've always enjoyed spending time in, in the mountains. Interestingly enough, I, uh, I'd given up geography for whatever reason uh, at GCSE level, like when I was 14. Um, so I didn't do geography through school, through high school. And then, but I'd, I'd always enjoyed maps, spending time in the mountains, navigation, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so after having done uh, my first degree, I went back and I got a master's and it was a master's of geography. So I went like full circle, having ignored it for the majority of my schooling uh, to get a master's and it was just kind of ridiculous. But uh, so I, I did this remote sensing thing and I, um, I became a spatial modeler for a local government research institute, uh, the Macaulay Land Use Research Institute, which um, doesn't exist anymore. I think it's now James Hutton Institute, anyway, uh, land, land research, sort of farming oriented applications, that kind of stuff. Um, so a spatial modeler, and I was asked to do lots of, uh, like, do, do GIS, but you're, you've got to do it in S, because that's what we're good at, S+, plus, which interestingly has become, largely has become R um, for, the, for, for the rest of us. S+, plus was like the proprietary version of R. Anyway. Um, so do remote sensing, but do it in this. And it's like, oh, okay, that's kind of annoying, but actually it's not because it's just all arrays and that's fine. Um, and then we moved on. I, I, I felt I had to pick up, a, I felt that if one was in GIS, one should work in the municipality at some point. So I did, did like an 18 month gig at Perth the Kinross Council um, in Scotland still. And um, 
got familiar with the dresses there. Um, and I look back on it and I think, wow, addresses is still such an annoying thing to deal with. It's still broken. <laughs> <laughs> I, in the UK, maybe they're now a little bit less broken because that was part of this kind of BS 766 thing, like modernizing government, everyone to use the same address standard, blah, blah, blah. Seems like a great idea. It was really hard to do, especially with addresses in the UK, which are like, I don't know, 2000 years old. <laughs> so, so it turns out they weren't using a standard then and the, what they were using then doesn't necessarily fit uh, like a British standard now. Anyway, whatever. Um, you do your best, you move on. Um, uh, and my wife and I at that point, we thought, oh, we should go on a big adventure. Because uh, we're sort of both mountain people. We wanted to go to sort of go out to the wilds. We, had this, we, we were, you know, havering. It's good Scottish word, havering. Between New Zealand and, and Canada. It seemed to be more, at that point, more geospatial going on in Canada, mainly because of the resource sector. Um, sent a few emails. Um, and found ourselves going to Canada and sort of landing, landing a job in British Columbia and worked in the resource sector of British Columbia for five years, um, doing in the most part what we would call kind of forestry, forest operational and resource analysis, GIS stuff. So it's like pretty hardcore. Lots of, for those who remember, lots of AML uh, routines and stuff. You'll be too young to remember. Yeah, yeah could you could you um, explain what that is? <laughs> that's like that's like when uh, that's like when Arc Info was a command line uh, activity. So, but an AML was like uh, Arc Macro Language, I think, and that's when you would just string. It was like deeply procedural. You just string all these commands together and run them, and then so but but you would combine that with like Bash scripts and little bits of Arc. To do kind of tabulations like pivot tables and stuff anyway it was pretty it was pretty cool and you could do some pretty robust uh geospatial analysis in that environment um and of course you like doing a bit of programming and, and and stuff so it that was that was kind of that was kind of interesting um but our, our company at that point had it were sort of on the cusp of like the economic crisis and um our company had gone through a change in leadership and the new leadership didn't necessarily jive with the old the old ways of doing things so there was like this internal strife within the organization between those people who want to do forestry uh which is what you know my the company i was with timberline had done and those people who felt we should move forward and be environmental whatevers um and jump on the kind of oil and gas sector which is which is kind of the, the, like the bifurcation of this organization. Um, and I was like, oh, this, this doesn't look good. And anyway, all I want to do is, is look to the future geospatial. And I, I, I felt like data, we should be doing some more stuff with data. Data seems like a really important thing. Um, so I was looking at what else was happening in the world. Google Earth had become a thing, like more of a thing. Um, Google Maps was becoming more of a thing. And it's like, oh, there are frameworks for doing things. Uh, also, I'd come in to Timberline um, and my, uh, my first boss was a fellow called Tyler Mitchell, who subsequently became the first executive director of OSGEO. Um, so that connection there too. And when I first came in, he had said to me, hey, well, we're gonna ask you to do remote sensing, but tell you what, you don't have any software to do it with. You're just going to do it in Python and and Gita. And I, oh, okay. So this was like back to my old spatial modeler days. It's like, okay, so uh, it's it's data in arrays moving around. Turns out remote sensing, uh, like imagery, looks really cool and hard, but it, it at a very basic level, it's just numbers in boxes. It's like, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's really all it is: is numbers and boxes stacked on top of each other. Um, and if you think about it in those terms, then then you you kind of understand the intricacies or the simplicities of what's actually happening in that kind of remote sensing fabric. So it's 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 really it's really interesting to sort of just to take things down to their their, their base components and then build them back up again. So I built a couple of libraries in there, open source libraries for uh, using uh, what was uh, sort of Landsat as distributed by the Canadian government at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so we, we I've done a bit of that and then. I'd done a couple of like freelancer.com gigs on the side just to get a feel for how it goes. I'd worked in the Canadian kind of contracting 
um, kind of uh, services sector, if you like. And I'm like, okay, so I know how this bit works because if you do work, people give you money for it. If you provide value, <laughs> people give you money. So like that bit's not very hard. So I started looking around and I'm a big fan of, of LinkedIn and Twitter. And I started mm -hmm. looking around and listening to what's happening in the community. And I'm like, oh, the places that are doing the, um, the places that are really talking or thinking about geospatial don't seem to be the resource sector anymore. I think it was in the early 2000s. I think there's a lot of stuff there. So certainly in the communities I've moved, early 2000s, lots of resource sector stuff. And then it, it kind of changed because I don't think the resource sector values data anymore. And I think that's still true today. Um, I, I think they, I think that'll change, but I, I think at this point they don't really value data in the same manner. And, and I, my experience is limited to the North American resource sector, so it, it may be different in other places. Mm -hmm. But um, and I, I was looking at communities that did value data, and I was trying to get this message through to my organization: Hey, we should do other stuff in other communities. But there was a lot of internal strife in my organization at that point. Um, and then up pops this message on LinkedIn. We need someone who knows about Google Maps. We need someone who knows about remote sensing. We've got an opportunity. Um, what do you think? And and I was like, oh, this might be the thing I need to do. Um, but to do that, it was it was to work with a, a nonprofit startup in San Francisco. I was still a UK citizen at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, I hadn't finished my Canadian citizenship. So to do that, I had to start a Canadian company in contract. So I started a Canadian company, I started Spark Geo. And to do this first, I, I, I left my previous job, started this company, did this gig. Took so a, when was took that? A, ooh, 2010. Okay. I uh, did this gig. So like right at the economic crisis. Like <laughs> the time, yes, uh, that's true. There was that. I, economic crisis, young children, probably a terrible time to start a business. But nevertheless, you, you, you kind of got to do these things when they happen. Otherwise, you live with regret, which is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So... Um, did that, did that whole piece, uh, started the business, started um, doing this stuff, took a, took a big pay cut. And then um, suddenly it was like, oh, this is how, this is how it works. You, you provide value, you write some code, people like it, they, they, they put money in your bank account. And that's, and that is the cycle that started. So that was Eco Reserve, which um, uh, didn't, didn't really take off the way we wanted to. The idea was that, um, there was this large tract of, of uh, Panamanian rainforest and people could sort of secure the future of a land, of, of a living room sized piece of, of that rainforest uh, in terms of kind of the land management and um, uh, the, I guess, you know, carbon, carbon sequestration, I suppose, mm -hmm. of, of, of that area. Anyway, the, the, the point is you're looking after this, this piece of, of land that is approximately the size of your living room. And you can have as many of these pieces of land as you want. And you sort of, you buy them and then you would be sent uh, sort of information about uh, the, the wildlife and, and uh, the ecology of that, of that location, which is kind of cool actually. Um, but it, it never really sort of resonated enough with enough people to, to take off. Um, nevertheless, it, it took me, it, it, it was a good process to go through and it took me to San Francisco, where I was able to see, and I didn't move to San Francisco, I just sort of worked for this organization, but I had to take a couple of trips down there. And, and you start walking around that town, you think, oh my word, there's a lot going on here. I should really be paying attention to, to this community because I, you, you suddenly get the feeling, and, and, and you do this in, the, in a couple of different tech communities or or uh, it doesn't necessarily tech, but any kind of business community, you start getting a feeling that there's a buzz. There's like this underlying sort of vibration of excitement and activity and interest and motivation. And it's like, wow, this is, yeah, there's a lot happening here. This doesn't feel like the resource sector at all. Um, and I should pay attention because I think this is, this is where, this is where people are doing things that I really care about. So I should, okay. you know, and I, I, I tossed around this idea of moving to San Francisco a couple of times. It's kind of awkward mm -hmm. um, to do that. So, and also up here where, where I live, I've got a great quality of life. Um, and I, I like the outdoors. So that's, that, that's the me thing. 
you know, um, if I was much more of an urbanite, then I would, I would maybe have pushed a bit harder for that uh, alternative. But I really like the outdoors um, and I like the space. So I, I, I sort of ended up with this lifestyle where I would go to sort of like big cities, have big conversations, do some stuff, then come home. It's nice and quiet and cool and, and relaxed. And it's like, that actually turned out working out pretty well for me. Um, and largely, so I, I, I freelanced for like four years in that, in that space and I was sort of bouncing to and from San Francisco doing, and then doing other gigs as well. We did some stuff with, with Mammoth Lakes and um, in the Sierras and uh, nextdoor.com. Um, so like doing, doing that, that thing. And then we started getting more and more uh, work coming in and it's like, oh, you know what? I should, um, I should, you know, I, I'm going to contract some stuff to one of my, one of my great friends. Uh, and then there's so much stuff coming in. It's like, well, you know, how about you just join us? I, you know, do an employee thing. Um, and then subsequently, um, more and more work comes in and you end up doing absolutely tons of stuff. And, uh, and now I'm in a position where I just get to talk about geospatial all the time. And I think I'm probably the worst software developer in the organization. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guy no one wants in their projects anymore. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, but I, I think what I bring is, is more sort of a broader sort of right. uh, vision of, of, of how things need to fit together now. Um, and, and sort of a level of sort of confidence around the industry. So, um, that's like, I think that's the, the longish story of, of Spark Geo, um, or at least the, the beginning of Spark Geo. There's no, numerous that's great. stories that are told every single day around our day-to-day -day lives, that's for sure. No, that's that's great. That's exactly what, what I'm looking for, the, the, the longish version of the, of the story. So this is great. Um, this sounds like, yeah, it's not, it's not this thing where you went to an investor and said, hey, I need, you know, X millions and, and like I'll build this no. thing. It sounds like this slow, steady thing where it, it was first, if I understood correctly, you for, for four years and then like more than you could handle. And then that starts growing to to where you guys are now. Yeah, it's it it's funny. Um I was sit, I, I I had this kind of epiphany, I guess, when I was sitting in, in YVR at Vancouver Airport. I'm very familiar with Vancouver Airport, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> um I was sitting there and, and I, I was thinking back to my, my first performance review for the Macaulay Institute. And they said to me, what do you want to do in 10 years? And I'm like, I have no idea. I probably want to, like, I, I thought, what would be cool? What would be cool? Independent consultant traveling around doing stuff. That sounded like a cool job. I should do that. So that's what I said. Which on reflection was a terrible thing to say in a performance review as well. Yeah, because then like, why would you say, why would you say that to your new boss? It's like, <laughs> um, what I want to do is not this. That's what I said. <laughs> and and I also reflect on that. And I think actually that first job was awesome. That was mm -hmm. like, it was like research assistant stuff. It was field work. It was writing code. That's actually a really neat job. Um, and I. Like so half of me is like, why on earth did I leave that gig? That was, that was like the best thing I could ever have done. Anyway, um, but it was nice also to reflect that I'd, um, without really planning to, I'd, I'd kind of got that, I'd sort of ticked that box. I was like, oh, turns out I am that guy. It's not quite as grand and exciting as I thought it was going to be. But nevertheless, I'm a guy who's sort of flying around consulting to some extent. And I, I'm, I'm using air quotes for those in audio. But um yeah, it's you know providing advice around something that I have developed uh, some kind of knowledge in, and I, I think that's kind of a neat. It's kind of it, it, it was just it was a nice reflection, a nice validation, but also it's interesting to observe that some things happen in your subconscious, and, right? And you know, you, you, you're not necessarily making it happen; it's just kind of happening because that's uh, maybe that's just part of your personality maybe you seek out environments where that that is a reality without you with because that environment looks more attractive because that's an environment that kind of makes sense to you not necessarily because you're like i am hunting for this it's just like oh i'm going to go there because that looks like a fun thing to do mm -hmm. and, and you just sort of, as a result you kind of create your own future um but yeah it's interesting yeah i bet well i I can also imagine, you know, the flying part didn't really turn out great this year, but. Uh... <laughs> no, no, or maybe it turned out great. I don't know. 
I um I uh I haven't been in an airplane since last March, uh, which is deeply unusual for me. Uh, I'm usually <laughs> airport lounge guy, but I am not airport lounge guy this year. I am basement guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I actually wanted to ask one one, one question. I, I I think is is I ask myself is um, people who who have the journey that you've had, where you started as what sounds to be this super technical uh, role, and isn't really much. Do you do you still code? Like not necessarily for work, but on the side. Do you, or do you miss it? I I will occasionally string up. A line or two of Python together, uh, but I do I miss it. I I like code because I like building things. And right. I still see myself as building things, so it's just a different kind of building. Um, I I like the challenges I have now. I find them interesting. Um, but um, do I miss it? I, I think I do to some extent. Um, okay. And I'm I'm very impressed by those CEOs who say, yeah, I'm still writing code. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure how you managed to achieve that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, because I feel, I, I feel like even if I'm on a project doing something, there's probably something else I really should be doing um, mm -hmm. that would benefit the organization more. So I think, right. I think about myself in those terms, kind of, I'm, I'm a, a to some extent, I'm a like a force multiplier because mm -hmm. I I can make a decision relatively quickly. It's easier for me because I'm at the top. I can make a decision quickly. That I don't necessarily have to ask for validation or, or or sort of confirmation. And so I'm 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 sensitive to that. That but but then that can also help things along too. And I can also like I can also make decisions around the risk that we might take as an organization. Right. Yeah. Um, because it's like, oh yeah, yeah, of course we can do this because I can see the benefit and you know what, it doesn't work out, it's on me. That's fine. Um, that's, so that's an easier thing for me to, to do too. So I, I can help projects in that way. And I, and you know what, I, I'm probably better now at going in and talking to people and, um, not necessarily, I don't like saying winning the work, uh, that, that, that's what it ultimately comes down to, but it's, it's like, it, it's more about telling our story. And it is about winning our work because our story typically um, typically provides people with the level of confidence around the kinds of things that we do on a on a day to day basis. Um, right. So, and, and and that and that story is, uh, is 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 really doing the the selling on our on our behalf. So I just go and tell that story and and see the kinds of things that we want to be doing and that we're motivated to do and ideally that path has uh you know that path continues to to set us to set us up for for just doing more and more interesting things when i when i hear the the story and and how at least from what you tell things seem to have changed a lot in the time that that, that you've been working so how do you also Great. um like stay in in touch if i if i may ask like about also the the super technical stuff because we are at like what, what you're doing in this field of, of geospatial we're in is also this really technical field, as you were saying, where a lot of stuff is, is happening. So how do you manage to, to keep up like that? Cause, cause when you're on, you know, on, on that, um, on that keyboard all day, writing those lines of code, well, you kind of have to, but how do you kind of manage to, um, keep an eye on what's going in the field as well and, and making sure you're not missing the, the next big thing well so we we're we're really lucky um the thing that we know that not many other companies know is what's happening in geospatial in a, in a variety of verticals okay um so we know what's happening in automotive we know what's happening in big ag we know what's happening to some extent in finance we have a good idea what's happening in governments um outside the military because we're, we're we're not inside the u.s military stuff um we do we have a good idea what's happening within sort of satellite constellations um so we have a pretty good idea of geospatial at various different various different verticals so i'm and, and a, a big proponent of the idea that like geospatial is this big kind of horizontal chunk that that 
can be applied to lots of different verticals. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's a really important concept to have in your mind. So you can be good at like one kind of analysis and, and you can think that you're a forestry person, but in fact, the same kind of analysis has been done by like retail people. It's like, oh, okay. So knowing that and being able to join those dots together is cool. So we have an organ, we have a structure inside our organization called guilds and guilds allow like DevOps person from one vertical to talk to DevOps person from another vertical who to like who are, who are doing like different projects. So they're like, oh, well, in automotive, we do this, but in big ag, we're doing that. That's really interesting. So we can, we overtly in our organization try and cross pollinate those ideas to make sure that like, cause that's, that's a really interesting way of capturing new ideas and capturing what we, uh, what we call like weak signals, um, which are trends like macro trends that are happening a across um, spectrum of our work, but b across the spectrum of our our industry, and those capturing those weak signals allows us to go, oh, those people should really do this because they're going to run into that problem soon, and that, that allows us to have those robust conversations with our clients and say, we think that this is, this is the pathway that you should go because we see how this is being done in different industries and in different places. It allows us to stay a little bit ahead of the game. So that's really important. We keep a close eye on, on what we would call uh, complementary assets. So okay. I, I would say, and you know, you can call me wrong, I would say, that um, the main reason that geospatial is really popular is because of three things that happen that are non-geospatial. One, uh, prevalence of handheld smartphones. Two, uh, prevalence cloud computing. Three, access to commercial space. Those three things mean that there are GPSs on 3.5 billion people. It means that we can undertake really big data analysis. And it means that there's a ton of sensors in the sky. Though those three things, which are non-geospatial in, in you know, business terms or in sort of practical sort of categorization terms have created what I would call a new version of, of like what might have one day in the past be called GIS. It's now something entirely different because of the framework that we're now working in um, this kind of business framework whereby with cloud computing, you can really store infinite amounts of data and you can do, and you can process infinite, uh, infinite numbers of algorithms conceivably, if you have the money, if you have the business, blah, blah, blah. Obviously there's caveats in there, but conceivably you're not limited by compute. Every single, it's sort of half the world's population, 49, I think 0.5% of the world's population is location enabled. That's insane. That's, that's an insane number of nodes on a network, which is effectively what every GPS device is. And 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 you're you you're part of this, but like the number of sensors that are floating around low Earth orbit and sending down pixels and pixels and pixels of data flow, I would expect that there's probably a petabyte of data flowing out in the sky every single day. I would expect within two years it will, will be 10 or 100 xing that amount. There's no technology at this point built which can turn that data flow into anything a human can consume. That is mm -hmm. crazy. So the opportunities for people who are familiar with geospatial, um, who are willing to explore, those opportunities are beyond belief right now. It's, it's really up to our imagination how we want to approach this market and who wants to build appropriate solutions uh, for, any of, for any of that. And I, can't, I literally can't count the number of applications that, that those um, derivative assets have provided our, our community. So frankly, the world's a oyster, um, but, uh, but we, need to get to this, we need to get to this place. So how do we stay, how do we stay in tune? Um, the most important thing is uh, um, as, as a leader, I listen, to my team who are telling me things all the time about what they see in the environment. And I, I spend a lot of time, still spend a lot of time on uh, like 
Twitter and LinkedIn. And just, but having a baseline curiosity about who's doing what and why they're doing that. And then being a little bit opinionated as to, as to the nature of our business. Um, I think those things combined is cool. We like, we overtly hire for, for curiosity and okay. for uh, people being opinionated. Because I think those things are important. I, like, I don't want people to be opinionated and, and grumpy about it. I want people to be opinionated and willing to have an open discourse, um, a respectful open dis- uh, discourse, because that's the way we come to a good place. Like that activity of a respectful open discourse has kind of been lost. And it's, it's kind of been sucked away by social media to some extent. Um, we try to sort of return that to um, uh, like th- that's something that we we seek out as an organization because we want to I want people to disagree uh, because if we have disagreements then we get to a place where oh maybe we weren't right and maybe there's a better way and maybe we should investigate that better way because if other people aren't investigating that better way then that's a really good opportunity for us that's a mm-hmm. cool thing we should do that so um, I find that kind of stuff really important and it kind of irks me that as a society we've lost this ability to respectfully disagree with each other and to know that it's okay that you you have a different opinion on something from somebody else and just to you know to remain friends <laughs> that's that's also been lost by society so um uh d- like i d- the take-home message is curiosity is is the way to um stay um, in touch and to stay ahead and, and sort of injecting that curiosity into, into everything that you do. This is a bit of a, not necessarily something I had planned to ask, but, but it makes me think like, I, I really um, appreciate what you're saying about, you know, having conversations. I, you know, first of all, I wish people, you know, were making podcasts to have conversation. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> um, but what I want to ask is, is about that we're in a field that, you know, takes data and turns it into actionable information. And, and that's usually what we would like to fuel conversations where, where people are opinionated, but it, it is based on that. How, how do you think our role is there? Um, I've, I've often, and so I, I think through this and I think through like, what is it that we're providing? We're as a, uh, you know, ISI is a great example. Um, everybody talks about SAR, wonderful tool for measurement. I think that's what we provide. We provide baseline informational products from which insight can be discerned. We are canaries in the coal mine, frankly. So we're, we're listening and we're observing changes, whether they be landscape changes or whether they be human activities, but changes to the built natural human landscapes of our planet. And we we get to report that back to society and society should be creating the tools to consume and then make judgments based on, on that. So it's hard to lie to a SAR satellite. I mean, that's a hard, like, you've got to work pretty hard for, I like, or, or even to do something nefarious. Because, like, SAR, you can look, you can look at something at night, you can look to the cloud. You, you've got to work pretty hard to either hide or, or lie to a SAR satellite. I mean, you could, you could mess it up by putting lots of angular stuff on whatever it is that you're doing. And then you just come out as this big white spot. So maybe, so maybe people are doing that. But, um, but it, it, it's hard to, and then you, you have an optical sensor, which would look and it's like, oh, okay, well, obviously someone's messed around with that thing, like deliberately, that's interesting. They're telling a different story. So I, I think what's interesting is that um, the geospatial sector, now, I, I, I guess I'm focusing on earth observation here, the earth observation sector, the sensory sector um, can be an arbiter of of reality, a measurement of the truth, which is which is good. Obviously, truth within the context of the device, within the context of the environment. So, like, like truth is hard to, to uh, determine in itself, but it is it, it's it's a measurement tool. Um, so, I don't think necessarily 
uh, geospatial people will be anything other than those people who provide our, our real measurements of, of that landscape change. I think that measurement form of landscape change is gonna be pivotal in, in our next sort of 25 years as we try and struggle deeply with climate change, as we try and struggle deeply with overpopulation and, 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 and all these things and sort of feeding uh, an ever growing population, all these things are gonna be tremendously difficult to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. And we need tools and planetary monitoring tools to achieve those things in, in no uncertain terms. Um, I think there's the so that's the that's the kind of the upstream part of the equation. The midstream, where we start thinking about domain expertise and we start injecting things like uh, geospatial ML and AI methods, that becomes interesting. And I think we have to be a little bit more careful about our responsibilities to our population and mm -hmm. their privacy at that point. Right. Um, there is a place where uh, where we risk technology getting too far ahead of policy in terms of us doing things because we can do them, not necessarily because we should do them. So we have to be careful around that stuff. Now, I think Earth observation is a little bit abstracted, unless we're getting to like super high resolution. But I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think uh, Earth observation is is like a measurement tool, and we just need to get better and better and better at measuring things, and um, we need to get better at normalizing those data sets to each other. So yep. you can have a like a robust multi-sensory environment. There's a lot of work to be done just in that. A lot of work to be done, but. Um, when we start thinking about those 3.5 billion people capturing GPS data overtly, that, that raises red flags in my mind around privacy mm -hmm. and around uh, individuals and around individuals' right to privacy and how we manage that stuff. None of that's straightforward either. Um, and I think that's where our, our industry needs to take some level of responsible stand. But to that, to do that, we need to have like industry representation. Right. I still think geospatial, especially this kind of new geospatial, I think we're kind of a bunch of misfits. So I don't really know <laughs> what that looks like. Like the, frankly, the OGC is probably the closest thing to that. And and that, but so the I think they're a, a body that struggles with dealing with um, these kind of new new geospatial misfits and governments and they're like this interface because mm -hmm. like even even i'd say stack is like rolled into uh ogc api um and so there's i mean this like it's sensible that that kind of piece is sensible because to do robust earth observation you need to be piping it into into government entities i mean that's that just makes sense um but also stacks a really good way for people and humans to to interact with data can like, you explain what stacks sorry, is? So not so not people humans like people like humans and machines. Is what I meant to say. Came out wrong. Um, sorry, you're saying Mike. No, I was just saying. Can can we explain what stack is? Yeah, a spatial central asset catalog. So it's a really good way of distributing uh, Earth of well raster based data. I guess uh, to, to you know to generalize it. So a good way of distributing mm -hmm. pixels. Um, and it, it's it's a, it, the take home message of um, of stack is it's a metadata layer. That allows humans and machines, like I was saying, to find appropriate imagery products um, more easily than they would have, and in a more structured way than they would have previously. So it's, um, I would say, it's an emerging best practice. Right. It's not by any means the only mm -hmm. way to do this, but it's one that we're seeing people coalesce around, and we're involved in that process. We see it. We've used it. It works well for us. Um, but you know what? It's it's one uh, it's one more way of approaching this common problem, and it's going to be a problem that, it, that that is literally getting bigger every day. It's how do we parse this astonishing amount of data that's coming out of the sky, um, and how do we deal with? There's so many interesting problems to solve in in that that it, like business problems, technology problems, every problem and like product problems in between. Um, so many problems to solve in the management and uh, of, of that data flow for the betterment of society. You know, like how do mm -hmm. we actually use that many pixels 
in a meaningful way that um, that people can create value from, or that societies can, um, uh, you know, create you know better places to live from. All these things are hard to achieve, and and again, uh, not 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 necessarily well understood yet. Do you think we have a um, and when I say we, I mean like practitioners, but also maybe at, at a company level, like what you're doing, do you think we have a, a role uh, in having to explain some of those things? Like you're mentioning the, the, the privacy. I think that's something that's really interesting because, you know, any data scientist, geospatial or not, is going to tell you, well, you know, more bet more data is usually better than less. There's, a, of course, caveats and things like that. So we're we're saying you know we how do we strike that balance is is it also about explaining to to people like this is why this is important do you think we have a role in that as well and do we have a role as individuals do do companies have have a role in doing that um i think we have a responsibility mm -hmm. to do that i think explaining what we're doing I, I however explaining what we're doing within the realms of reality i think the remote sensing community tried to explain what we were doing 10 years ago but we weren't actually doing what we wanted to do we weren't as good at it as we wanted to be so and 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 interestingly we are now <laughs> I, I don't i i, I yet yeah, potentially we, we we kind of burned ourselves by telling everyone my god like we could we, we have pervasive monitoring of everywhere on earth well no we didn't uh, we were mm -hmm. actually quite a long way from that uh now conceivably we can take a picture of everywhere on earth and like soon i i uh, I, I think we'll be able to take a picture of everywhere on earth including including places that are cloudy. And then we'll be able to do it when it's dark. And then we'll be able to refine resolutions and do it in multi-spectral environments. And soon we'll be able to do all this stuff. And we're not far from any of that now. I mean, that that all that stuff is within the realms of reality. And we do need to be able to explain it and explain why what we're doing is important. Um, why this whole planetary monitoring effort is, is kind of pivotal to uh, how our planet is managed. Um, so we, A, um, understand the flow of commodities, B, understand um, how, uh, how we impact our landscapes, and, and C, understand how, how we can sort of optimize our landscapes so as, as, as a growing population, we can, we can actually e exist in, you know, in some sense of harmony, but also um, give people a reasonable um, life if they happen, it, you know, if they're unlucky enough to be to, to be born in a in in a place in, in strife or um, with with societal pressures. I mean, we have in no uncertain terms we're going to be seeing more and more societal pressures, whether that are hard, you know geographically oriented, whether they be whether they be famines, whether they be lack of water whether they be sort of lack of resources, all this stuff is, is coming to a head and we're gonna be seeing this stuff and needing to be managed, need, need to be managing this stuff deeply within the next uh, like quarter century. Uh, so these are the problems that we as a society are gonna struggle with. Remote sensing is, um, as a tool, is gonna to be critical in the monitoring and management of, of that. And, and this notion of landscape change is going to be a pivotal concept from which to draw our successes or failures in mm -hmm. that management. It's it, it's like it's a test of policy, but it also is uh, allows us to understand how different policies might perform in different environments. So I think as we as we grow as a society, we're gonna it's gonna become plainly obvious who is managing. For climate change most effectively who is managing for societal pressures most effectively and um and and you know i i often say like remote sensing is like looking at your neighbor's homework i mean you're able to look over and I, you know you're all you're all doing an exam at school and you're all at your own desks it's like being able to look over and seeing how how your um how your neighbor's doing and sort of copying their homework to some extent because you can see it's like oh 
that country is doing that really well. I wonder, like, what's the policy that drove that? We should do more of that because that's a good thing. And, you know, they're succeeding in, in air quotes because of, of whatever policy drove that environmental change. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and you can see that and you can say, oh, that's going to happen in agriculture. It's going to happen in real estate. It's going to happen in insurance. Uh, it might even be driven by insurance, frankly. Um, it's going to happen in natural resources. It's going to happen in all these sort of deeply geographic fields. Um, and we, uh, as, as, the, the, um, as the technologists, need to be able to defend, I guess, the, uh, our practices to, to, to justify that they are up to the task of this monitoring, um, of, like, of this planetary monitoring. And, and I, think, I think we are. Um, I don't think we've quite got the capacity that we're going to need. I think we've got some big gaps, which is great because there's lots of business opportunities for, for technologists like ourselves to, to engage in. But I, I, I deeply feel that remote sensing will have to become one of those tools that is um, this notion of planetary monitoring will, will be critical. And I think there'll be a number of different you know, institutions and organizations and businesses who are interested in and paying close attention to that to that trend there's a there's a i really like your most recent i think it's the most recent article that that, that you put out on on your website um that's called the, the geospatial product trap mm. that feels like um it's a bit what where we just touched on could you explain what you meant in that article so yeah i'd like i'm going to caveat this with um for, like focus on two words there, geospatial and product. Um, if you want to build a geospatial product, you need you need focus. If you want to build a product, you need focus. Um, so the irony or the paradox is that um, that Spark Geo works in numerous different verticals. So I'm gonna I'm gonna caveat this discussion with the fact that that we do not sort of easily fit into this box. However. We do work with a lot of startups too, and um, and what I see with a lot of startups uh, is a couple of patterns. Um, one of the patterns is the slide that says we can work in all these different sectors: agriculture, cars, blah blah blah, a bunch of different sectors. And then and then you ask, that's great, um, I, like like. But, but which one are you going to focus on? And they're like, oh, uh, we're going to do them all. Like, no, you're not. You're, you're like literally no company on earth can do all these sectors. Even if you are like publicly traded large satellite company, you're not going to do well at all these sectors. You need to build appropriate sales and marketing, appropriate engineering. You, like every time you, you delve into a particular sector, you realize that that sector ends up going really deep. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna build a product for a particular sector, then you're gonna need engineering capacity to focus the product on that sector. You're gonna need salespeople who've walked in the shoes of your clients, who understand your client deeply, and you're gonna need marketing people to help tell, tell that story. All those things need to happen. And then you need to multiply that out by every single sector. So. So like there's two opposing ideas here. One is geospatial is everywhere and you can do anything. And the other is you should only really do one thing. So you can do anything, but you got to choose one. And, and so that's, that's the hard thing to square. For an earth observation company in particular, what I've seen work really well is, is this focus on partnerships as opposed to individual customers. So as an earth observation company, you don't necessarily, well, you could be vertically oriented um, and, and you see some good examples of that. Spire do a good job of that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, there's some uh, weather, I think Climacell, did they just become tomorrow.io? I think they did. Uh, I so forgot the name, like, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they, they like radar remote sensing, but like we're only going to do weather. But one would expect that there might be opportunities to sell actual data products to, uh, to, to other people too. So um Vertically oriented stuff is cool because they're like, we're building these satellites, it's gonna do this one thing. Um, but if you're 
building this constellation and you want to sell to the entire you know swathe of the geospatial is everywhere market then you need to build partnerships with organizations who understand particular domains so they can do that piece of of imagery manipulation business intelligence whatever it is on top of your data and then they get to own the domain and 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 deeply understand the domain and they can walk in their client's shoes on your behalf and all you need to do is just focus on the data provision piece and take a royalty of everything that they sell that i i think that's a, a really neat model as well but unless so the the other thing to think about is and this is particularly true of uh optical sensors but i think i think it's also very true of, of active sensors rarely is the the raw data product the final um product so and and with the exception i think of uh the defense sector where looking at an image tells you a story and it's actionable and you can do a thing other than that situation and and this notion of base maps where you have this like living background map but um other than that high repeat imagery isn't useful like i don't want as a i've lived my life as a gis guy i did, i never wanted a new image of a particular place every day that that is just not a useful product i right? and if the place i'm managing is large and i'm looking for things i absolutely don't want an image every day because that's a whole bunch of work what am i <laughs> and, and also if you think about that if i'm getting an image every day then i want to do something with that image i want to turn it into some kind of value i'm probably drawing a box around a feature or something yeah what i want every day is to be told that there's a change that's the product the product is change it's not pixels so thinking about that notion is really interesting because i think the opportunity afforded by high repeat remote sensing is enormous and pivotal and it's it, it's one of those kind of transformational technologies that needs to happen but i think the product of an image or a data product every day is is deeply broken and not exciting to the vast majority of people who will end up having to deal with that data product. So I think I think that's a really interesting dichotomy. So that, that and and I think probably the same is true of active sensors, maybe more so because like the, the the basic active sensor product is is pretty hard to interpret. It's not an easy thing. So there's a, this immediate barrier which is that's cool, you can see through clouds, you can look at night but I don't know what you're telling me. I don't know what the story is. Whereas with EO, at least you know, like you understand the bit. Oh, it's it's a picture of my house. You know, whatever. It's a picture of the um, you know, the like my my forestry thing. It's a picture of this real estate thing. It's like it's understandable. SAR is like, oh, I I kind of get it, but it's hard. Help me understand it. Like, give me the data product which I need. Show me that there's a landslide here. Show me that the subsistence will be here. That kind of thing. is really important and you know that kind of thing on a day to day basis is going to be really important for our society but we need to have this extra layer of transformation from raw data into into reality mm -hmm. and with that kind of data flow it's it's a it's a strategy i mean it's it like at least in eo land we have things like gdal i think in mm -hmm. um so not eo land in like optical land we have gdal in in active land we need like a we need like a gdal to sar uh to to allow that kind of uh open source ish community to to sort of hack away at that data to like to bring out some of that innovation um sar processing still seems to be quite an expensive proposition um <laughs> and, I, and 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 i'm not i i i don't begrudge the people who put in a ton of work into that um but i i do think it so i i think that it is worthwhile spending money on algorithms but i think that the more people the more people you have on a problem the the more solutions you get to that problem so you could spend money on uh a sar algorithm and i think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do build a pipeline around it do the whole thing i think that's a great idea but if you want to take sar to the masses and if you want to inject sar into the finance community and the sar into the 
you know, insurance community and SAR and to everybody else, you need some kind of open source tooling to open up that, that, that black box to allow it to happen. I think, I think that's going to be an important step forward. Um, I mean, you only need to look at how, how GDAL is used across, across many different communities to, to, to see that. I do want to talk about GDAL, but just before that, I want to answer the question that you raised just before that I really want to answer, want you to answer, which is you guys seem to be doing just that as well about like going on multiple fronts. So, yeah, yeah. so yeah. how do you so, solve yeah, that? It, 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 it's a great paradox. So am I just whining at other people? <laughs> well, you tell me. A terrible hypocrite. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a difference between being a product and being a service company. Um, right. We can be, so being a service company means that we get to charge what I would call service rates. Um, so we can, we can build an environment by which uh, people are accessing us for our, our ability to innovate in a geospatial manner. Uh, we have some particular strengths around, uh, around cloud-centric applications and around earth observation applications. Um, but in general terms, we're just pretty good at, 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 at dealing with location within the context of um, the cloud. That's, that's really what we're, what we're best at. We put maps on the internet, as we said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, that, as a services entity, is useful for different organizations um, in, in different places. And, and we're overtly a services company. So... What, that, what a services company means is that if you removed the people, there's really not much left, yeah? We're based on relationships and we're based on intellectual capital. So that's, that's our organization, yeah? If you're a product company, there's something left. There's something that's sellable, if you like. You, right, you, I see. You've got, a, you've got a widget machine, yeah? Whether the widget machine's in the sky and is linked to a ground station, you've got a machine that works independent of the people. It's a it's a product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you're selling a product, or um, you're selling an opportunity in that regard. So, the thing about a, a services company is because we have in, because we're selling intellectual capital on a on a transaction per transaction basis, we're probably more expensive than than a widget machine, but we don't really have much in the way of intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. And so these two things mean that if you build a widget machine, you need a much bigger sales entity right. to sell more of your widget. Um, we don't have any salespeople at all. Okay. I, I, like I'm the sales guy. I, and we have <laughs> one other person with the word sales in their, in their job title. Okay. That's it. Our, our sales is through uh, referrals, is through discussions like this. Um, and through um, long-term partnerships that, that we okay. create because we provide value. When, um, when widget machine or geospatial widget machine is, is selling into ver like a whole bunch of different markets, you need to change the machine for every one of those different markets. If you keep on changing the machine, you never dial into to one particular market in, effect, in, in an effective enough manner that you get broader market, like you get actual market penetration. So if you're going to build a machine, you need that machine to be well honed to serve that purpose. Um, so you want to build, I want to build a really good machine that does, uh, that does like weather. That's a mm -hmm. great thing. Okay, we're going, to, we're going to make our machine super good weather machine, but we're not necessarily going to make it useful for forestry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, conceivably foresters care about the weather, but maybe not so much. So we know we're not going to tune our machine for those guys. We're going to tune our machine for these people. And, and then when you start looking at weather, you're like, oh, who do we really care about? Do we care about logistics? Do we care about insurance? Do we care about um, all these other different verticals? Oh, actually, no, we're going to tune it for logistics. So we're going to give you weather like on a five minute by five minute cadence. That's the machine mm -hmm. we're going to build. We're not going to build this like catastrophe machine for for uh, for the insurance side, we're going to build like high cadence weather guy weather machine for for logistics. So you're tuning and tuning and tuning and tuning, and then once you get it, it's like okay, now we've got a product that everybody wants in this sector. 
and we're going to sell it really hard because right. at that point, because it's a smaller individual sale price, you need to sell it many times. Um, in services land, we rarely do the same thing twice. So our, our like transaction cost is a bit higher. Um, so we're able to, because we're basically selling our capacity to undertake geospatial projects and, and think through problems and provide solutions, we're able to attack different sectors because we're, we're structured differently. Um, if you have a product, and that's what I'm saying at the big, like the caveat at the beginning was, this is relevant to product companies. Right. And, and, and also I'll get into the sales discussion in a second. Um, sure. But so with product guy, you, you, you need to sell a bunch of things in a particular vertical. That becomes easier if you're super focused. When you're in a sales discussion, this like, sales discussions for product products are different from sales discussions for services. And in, in, in products, it's like, do you do this? Yes. Do you do that? Yes. Do you do this? No. Do you do this? Yes. Do you do that? No. And you have this kind of discussion. It's like a yes, no discussion. Um, in services, it's like, do you do this? Yeah, sure. Do you do this? Yeah, sure. Do you do this? Yeah, sure. Do you do this? Yeah, I, you know, in fact, we can do anything you want. It's What's more, can you do this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, it, it, that's exactly it. Everything within the realm of geospatial and the cloud for us is more than possible. We've seen a lot of that. We feel comfortable. And unless someone's like talking about something just completely off the wall, it's like we've never heard of that before. But in the most part, we've seen a lot of things and we've dealt with a lot of data and we feel pretty confident about the kinds of things we get asked to do. So usually the discussion is, um, it, it is much easier for services because we're not bound by, by the, uh, the ability of a product to do a particular thing and, and the feature set and the, the things that have been built and the products uh, like pipeline. Oh, we're not bound by that. We can just say, yeah, we'll use this product for that. We'll use that product for this piece and we'll, and we'll tie it all together with, with glue code, which like often I describe Smart Geo as writing glue. We like geo <laughs> glue between different products, which is which is cool. And like like largely that's 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 what we do. So there like there's an overtly different thing between services and products. And the, the thing about services, or for us, like th this is why I describe us as being a, like we're basically a terrible business because we don't do what people <laughs> um, I it, I, there's there's going to be no HBR articles about Spark Geo because there's no repeatability. It's 100% intellectual capital, new problems every single time. I think it keeps our team pretty engaged to get exciting mm -hmm. things to do. But yeah, this is this is not a widget machine, um, which means that yeah, our sales discussions are much easier, and we don't need a massive sales team. But no, once the individuals go away there's very little value left. Right. And that's, so it's, it's a very different situation. Um, but I can understand how, um, how it would be easy for someone to say, like Spark Geo guy, what a hypocrite. Like he's right, like he's doing all the stuff he says he shouldn't do. And I'm like, well, that's <laughs> true. But the, the nature of it is that we're a services company. People come to us because we have a, a pretty decent Rolodex mm -hmm. and they, they want to sell a geospatial product through us. Mm -hmm. Or they're asking for advice, and mm -hmm. so so I'm more than happy to provide advice. And I, I, we've seen a lot of startups. We've seen a lot of people um, sort of go through the process, and some are super focused and they do well. Some are less focused, and they just need a little bit of of, of help to find that focus. Does that make? Does that help explain it? It's very yeah, absolutely. No, that's that's actually great. This is this is exactly what I was looking for, and. I'm not calling you a hypocrite. Absolutely not. <laughs> well, no, but it, like it's something I struggle with myself because I'm like, you know what? Uh, I I I'm not. I, I I probably need to write a rebuff to my own blog post, please, and, and and just describe that because I there there are there are different ways of approaching a market, and mm -hmm. uh, so we also have some repeatable code. And the interesting thing, we also have a Maptix product, and the Maptix product was trying to be this. Uh, like, like we can do everything for everybody in this kind of web map analytics market. And it was actually much easier when you just refine it and say, actually, we're only going to work with these people because this is like, mm -hmm. we understand these people mm -hmm. and they understand us. And that's just a way easier conversation. Once mm -hmm. we figured out these people, we'll talk to those people. And, and just like quantifying it in that manner just makes, it just makes life a lot easier. Um, and, and we've done the other, we're, we're like swung the other way. And we've got some repeatable components of code 
that we use for Earth observation stuff when we call out prescience. So Earth, but we're keeping that only ever like 80% complete because we're always asked to do weird custom things. Turns out geospatial is like full of weird, it's, it's, it's basically 100% edge case. That's mm -hmm. what I've learned. Or, or we don't understand our market effectively, right. which may also be true. Um, but if we keep everything at like 80% complete and there's always it's 20% of like custom work on top of A, um, that means that we can always say yes in our services discussion again. But, it, but B, it allows us to accelerate our delivery process a bit. So that's, so that's how we've been approaching that. And we're being asked to do more and more earth observation, ingest and sort of, um, and analysis and, and sort of serving out projects. That seems to be a very common pattern these days too. So we've, we've gone from one side, which is build this fully formed product, which only very few people care about to build this very partially formed component tree like Lego set, and we're gonna build it uh, fit for purpose for individual clients. Two very different models and we sort of test them against each other. It's quite interesting. So we're all, I guess we are our own little HBR article. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. I, 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 I do wanna ask the question then, how, how do you choose the stuff you get to work on? Um, how do we choose? Like, so it, like because because you can say yes to everything. Like there is, of course, a, a matter of like you have to ultimately decide. You, you're not choosing one, but you're choosing multiple. But like, how does that? What makes? What's that decision process like? It's so it's interesting. Um, sometimes, sometimes I've I, and this is like how I, I I used to do a lot of my business development. I would. I would have an idea and I would think, who cares about that? And then I would have a look around on the internet and figure out who's caring about it. And then I would call them or email them or whatever and say, I think you should probably do this and, and we can help you do that. So I try to identify who in the market has a particular pain at a particular time. Right. It's an interesting set of skills. So like, I, I really wanted to do automotive work like five years ago. And okay. um, we had a couple of conversations with a couple of startups in San Francisco. We didn't really get anywhere with them. And I was like, oh, it's kind of annoying, but, but they, they're super cagey about IP, which is understandable. Um, so yep. it, you know, it took time to, to make that work. Uh, but subsequently, because the, the majors are now interested in automated vehicles and therefore geospatial, suddenly there's a lot of activity around mapping in automotive it's there's a lot of people highly motivated to mm -hmm. invest in that you know i well we could argue that uber sort of opened the door for that which is great all part of them um but uh but i think now we're in a situation where that investment is it needs to happen more broadly so like you do have companies like here uh out there and Mapbox is making a big big plays in automotive but you still need a general understanding within each automotive organization of how geospatial works. So therefore there are, is a need. So therefore there's pain to be resolved. So therefore there's a place for, for a company like Spark Geo to provide some help. Um, and the, the nature of it is if you've got a startup in San Francisco, they care about automated vehicles within a relatively small geographic area. Some of yep. them were busting yep. out to like Phoenix or other places, but like limited geographies. If you've got the majors involved, the geographies that they need to operate in are significantly bigger, which means the problems are significantly harder to solve. So, so therefore you've got these entities, these large automotive companies who need to build mapping teams. Okay. And, you know, like you could, right now, the world is your oyster. If you're a geospatial person, if you can write a little bit of code and you understand a little bit of geography, you could choose your industry to work in. And there are numerous different places you could provide value and you just got to choose wherever you want to go. Because you could, you could work on cars, you could work on satellites, you could work in agriculture. You could just, it's like, the, like, the, like typing in geospatial to LinkedIn now, you're going to get thousands and thousands and thousands of, of different job ads. If you did that 10 years ago, you're getting like a handful. 
mm-hmm. like this notion of geospatial as opposed to GIS. Right. Uh, I think though I think the the relative amounts of activity in both those uh, in both those segments has has uh, it has flipped it's entirely flipped. It, it's it's fascinating to watch. So. You mentioned something that I, I did want to touch upon and get your thoughts on. You mentioned this thing that that's called GDAL. Um, yeah. And and so GDAL, yeah. I wanted to to because I saw that you guys also uh, sponsor um, even the the maintainer the current maintainer of GDAL. So I wanted to ask why. And so yeah, could you could you tell me what GDAL is and like at a high level? why it's important, why you decide to, to sponsor the folks doing that. So Geospatial Data Abstraction Library, GDAL, mm-hmm. uh, open source, um, open source glue, I would have said for geo, uh, absolutely, absolutely pivotal piece of technology uh, on, on which um, very large amounts of geospatial infrastructure sits, frankly. Um, for the longest time, it was underfunded. A like classic open source project, it sat on. Um, you know, there were a handful of maintainers. Um, you know, some of which were virtually full time in maintaining the technology, and and you have these enormous companies leveraging that toolkit and not really paying for the privilege of doing so. Mm-hmm. Um, We've always been sort of acutely aware that it was kind of a free thing for us, um, because you know I, I think you know, a, a, everyone in Spartio knows that uh, a tremendous amount of effort goes into open source technology, mm-hmm. um, and it always seemed ridiculous. And it's like the same thing with OpenSSL for a long time. It was just like a handful of people maintaining this thing, and then and then suddenly there's this realization that oh wow. So much of the internet sits on this, and like so much of the geospatial internet sits on GDAL. And if GDAL was to fail, that would be a big problem. That's a big problem. Also, so it's not just like the negative side of it, it's a big problem. It's like, why, why is uh, why is Evan not the most um lauded software developer in the community? Yeah, he like, should be a rock star. Work, exactly for the amount of work that guy puts in, it's ridiculous. So, um so we've always been a big fan of them, and there was uh, and 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 Howard Butler and and Mr. Ramsey um, yep. is um, putting in. They have put in a ton of effort, um, like behind the behind the scenes, to support um, to support GDL as best they can. So there was GDL Barn, I think, two years ago, which was like, oh, we need to raise some money for GDL, but it was like a one off, and that was okay. problematic. It's like, you know, that's you know, it's good, but it was it was not, and then. Um, then there was an effort to like we should sponsor event uh, on on like GitHub, mm-hmm. like GitHub sponsor stuff, uh, which is again okay, but it's not really the solution. I mean, okay. it's uh, it's an approach, and at least it it um, it highlights those organizations who care, and it compensates event to some extent uh, for his efforts, which which is great. But most recently, there has been a more robust sponsorship of um, of GDAL, which has been announced, and it's great to see some much some of the much bigger names um, in geospatial being associated with that, putting in reasonable like reasonably large sums of money. So I think GDAL is now going to be funded at least to, as I understand it, the extent of a couple hundred thousand USD mm-hmm. a year, which you know I at the very least. Um, you know, pays for pays for the maintenance of that of that technology full time and um, uh, at, at a decent rate. I, I, it's obviously not just going to event at that point. It's going to yeah. a whole bunch of other stuff. But um, and I think it's a multi year arrangement. So okay. there, it, and it's forward looking. So it's it's absolutely pivotal for our community. GDAL could not. If GDAL was to go away, um, a lot of the um, the innovative activity around geospatial would go with it, mm-hmm. and and that would be a terribly sad thing. I think geospatial has become 
incredibly useful, incredibly pivotal, incredibly pivotal um, to a number of different organizations and a number of different um, a number of different individuals. And, and, and to the extent that geospatial is now, I would say, a consumer activity, like right. Snap Map and Google Maps and all that kind of stuff. Like we have G GPS on our on our phones. God knows we have LiDAR on our phones now. <laughs> ridiculous. So geospatial is now a piece of everyday life without things like GDAL um, and, and a suite of other kind of open source-ish tools. You lose the ability for new ideas to, um, to penetrate. Uh, if you have to yeah. pay large sums of money for licenses to do things, you don't get the, um, the bedrock of, of hacking that you need to, to build this kind of innovative economy. If you've got to pay a bunch of money to get a software license, that's a big barrier to entry. It's not to say you exactly. should at some point pay a bunch of money for a software I license. Agree. Like people should pay for software because people put effort into the creation of the software. But, and, and that's why we need to pay Evan. That's why, you know, like people got to pay their mortgages. All that stuff's going to happen. But if you have a bunch of open source technology, then you have this, this kind of ferment of innovation that goes on. That's this underlying innovation that from which ideas pop up and people go, oh, I can use that here and I can use that there. And this is available. I'm, I'm going to test this idea. And would this idea work? And with that kind of stuff going on, you create an economy based on technology. So that's, that's how open source creates ideas, how open source creates value. And then you have this, this community who can sort of inject their, their ideas in the form of pull requests into that baseline technology. So it, it's a self-fulfilling cycle um, that without that, that sort of glue in the middle, which is GDAL, I mean, you could argue that maybe someone would rewrite GDAL, but that would take a heck of a time. Uh, so without that glue in the middle, and we've already got GDAL, it's a wonderful tool. Without that glue, a lot of that innovation just disappears, uh, which means we're, we're in a big, we'd, as, as a community, we'd be taking quite a number of steps backwards. I, I, also, I also think one of the great things about the fields we're in is that a lot of people come across it later in their life like it's not something you study and you go like to well you know people like you seem to have studied it and and, and gone there but i think a lot of people also haven't and that's one of the great strengths of that and and that you can come from something completely different a, a field that's completely different and because there's this like lower barrier to entry we get like a huge diversity of, of backgrounds from people and and by diversity of background i mean like every definition of that term that you could imagine and i think it's it's quite important to keep that going that you know we want as many people that aren't from this field to come in and say hey why are you guys doing this well because we didn't think about it um yeah yeah, and, and so uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. We uh, we seem to have a preponderance of people who come from biology mm -hmm. in geospatial. I'm like, that's really interesting. I guess there like there is a, like a geographic link to some extent, but uh, but yeah, like coming from different backgrounds, uh, providing value, um, and and you're right. Lowering that barrier to entry means that they can engage and they can go, oh. This thing, like my domain, I, I came from like trading and I can deal with geography. Oh, I know how to join these things together. Right. Oh, this is a really useful thing I did. I didn't know this was gonna happen. This is really useful. I wonder if other people wanna riff on this idea a bit further. It, that kind of stuff is it, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I wanna um, come back to one of the things we, can, we, we talked about earlier. And I think this is something you wrote about as well which is this idea of the, the cloud native geospatial. Um, I think you wrote a bit about that idea that it, it kind of follows this idea of, of open source and yet a lot of the cloud infrastructure, that is one of the three components that you were talking about that is necessary to, to bridge that. That's not really, that's that's very proprietary stuff. There's like these, the AWSs and the Azure of the world. Could you um, maybe go on there a little bit? Yeah, it's, it, I, it, it's fascinating. So. Uh, I go back to the experiences, my first sort of experiences in San Francisco and wandering around talking to people in San Francisco. And, and you know, we're talking about requirements, talk about their needs. 
And I'd say, you know what? There's, there's, there's like, there's like geospatial software that will do some of this stuff for you already. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but we want to own the IP. We don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to use anyone else's software. We're going to own the IP because we're venture funded. And uh, so I'm like, oh, it's cool. We'll just build it off the, the open source stack. That's right. fine. So use open source, and we build our IP on top of that. Everything's good. Um, uh, we all, we all sort of. Uh, we all pray at the altar of uh, Gidal <laughs> and, 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 and Postgres, frankly. So, so all, yes. all kudos to those technologies, which are like cornerstones of our yep. of our uh, of our environment. But um, but but that's notion is really interesting because they would do that, and then they would put all their uh, uh, technology into a proprietary cloud, and, and and I think that's cool. It's like it, it's so cool. It's, it's just it's just fascinating that. That and, and I'd say, oh, that's really interesting. You're you're not owning your own infrastructure, you're buying it. Um, and, and they're like, yeah, 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 well, but uh, but we're we're only gonna use East, you know, EC2s and SG buckets. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. And then quite quickly they go down a, a rabbit hole of like uh, messaging frameworks and and convenience factors and lambdas, and like, oh, you're you're like you quite quickly get locked in to a particular, because they build very useful tools for uh, large infrastructures to scale against. So it, it, it's, I'm not for, seeing, for a second saying that cloud technology is um, uh, not very helpful for a mm -hmm. scaling startup and absolutely pivotal to a number of them who are sort of collecting large amounts of data. I mean, like the data centers alone for, for a, an organization that's collecting EO data would be off the charts expensive yeah. and an immediate barrier to, to entry. So that's why the cloud is a, a complementary asset to, uh, to geospatial. Without robust cloud resources, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing now. So, um, but it is an interesting uh, dichotomy of thought within these organizations Right. I want to own IP here, but I'm going to buy infrastructure there. And then, so my question is always, where's the line? Like where, where does infrastructure start? Because if you, if you look at the cloud, infrastructure is working its way, is way up the value chain. It's, right. It started at EC2s and so it started at storage and, um, and like serving. And now it's moving up and you got lambdas in there. And now it's moving up and you've got messaging frameworks in there and it's moving up, it's moving. It's like, like, which is the bit that, that you do? Like, <laughs> like where's, where's your value in this chain? Where's the bit that you, uh, you add on top of just stringing together cloud services. And it's, it's, it's definitely worthwhile as a business thinking about, right. about that, because that, that tells you where you are rare and where you are, where someone can imitate you at a very low cost, and and I, I th it, it's super interesting. So, like going back to the initial, we want to own our IP discussion. Yeah, that's important for a startup to have some sense of IP. Now, you don't have to get patents or anything, but you want to keep your trade secret. Uh, you want to keep your special sauce to yourself. But if your special sauce is simply that you can tie. AWS services together quicker than the next guy or in a different way, maybe you're still saying that's special. Um, yeah, especially it's, when it's interesting. A lot of the a lot of the tools that allow to do like these cloud deployment stuff, like Docker or Kubernetes, they are also a lot of open source stuff and, and yeah. like these open things. Yeah. So you're like, oh, we're gonna make this thing cloud agnostic. There's this term that 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 is used, yeah. which is true because you could always, you know, pull back and put that on a server rack internally. But yeah, it, it, it doesn't really happen. Um, there's there's many reasons why, but yeah, it's 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 very interesting to to, to have it, that. It, it is interesting. In in the end, uh our our friend Mr. Bezos seems to do very well off. Of, of, <laughs> of the success of of our industry and and so i don't begrudge that because quite clearly the cloud is a complementary asset to what we have uh, available to us we couldn't do what we do without access to large amounts of storage and large amounts of compute um, our organization spark geo clearly we have no servers like we've never had a okay. server 
Uh, we've never had any, like yeah. we don't have any real estate. So where on earth would we put a server? So we, like we're enabled largely by the cloud. We've always been cloud centric, cloud first organization. And it allows us to be that way. So that's amazing. Um, so no one's in terms, it's amazing. But I do think it's fascinating to think about where an organization's IP really lies. Right. And, um, and what is it that you do that you provide to a community for value that, that is something that other people cannot do easily? Well, where is that value? Like, like eking it out. There's lots of other things that you need to do as an organization, but where is your value lie? Um, and us as a, as a you know, geospatial services company, our value would not lie in maintaining servers for other people. Yeah. Um, however, Mr. Bezos has a great solution for that. And as do, as do our, our friends at Microsoft and, and indeed our friends at Google. And we're, we're asked to use each of those different environments depending on how our clients do it. And, and that's fine for us. We can engage with each other. Like these companies have built good services, which are easy to string together. They don't necessarily always engage in good practices and, and the, the open source community has been subject to some of those practices. But in the end, we are able to do things that we could not do before. And I, 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 for me, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, I'm beholden to, um, to that idea. So cloud native geospatial is pivotal to, uh, I've said that word far too many times uh, <laughs> in this discussion, it, it, but there's so many things that are very important to our community being um, able to execute on this, on this notion of um, delivering value to the three and a half billion people and being able to parse all that data. To do that, we need big machines and very few organizations on earth have those big machines at their initial disposal. So the cloud has allowed us to uh, test things out, to fully engage in activities um, that we could not have engaged with previously without enormous amounts of investment. Um, and there's already enormous amounts of investment, yeah. but the great thing is that investment's going into what I would call top end value, like the new stuff, like more sensors in the sky. Um, I'm right. glad that investment is not going into how do we build a bigger data center? Because that's <laughs> what we need to do to put in. A, like, yeah. like people have figured that piece out and they're innovating on it and it's getting better and that's cool. But we as geospatial people can figure out the cool geospatial stuff that is gonna provide greater value in the end to our communities and that's what we should be focusing on so I, I think i think in the end it's a good thing for us but there are some unpleasant practices that are sort of at play as well we need right. to be yeah. sort of cognizant of i, I just want to ask quickly um and you know what do you think of of google earth engine um because like that's a very different approach to this notion of of um cloud so in in short google earth engine is this thing where you know, you go in your browser and, and you have a JavaScript console and access to this huge catalog and you can just query whatever all these open um, data sources. So, so what do you think of that? Um, in I that think context? Google Earth Engine is, uh, I think it's the future. I think we need more of that kind of activity. I still think you still need an Earth observation professional to parse okay. what Earth Engine is telling it. Like you. Like, as a, a, a lay person, um, I don't think you'd get a lot of value out of Earth Engine. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah your mom's you, not going to use Earth Engine. Yeah, you still need to understand the algorithms. However, they've taken an enormous amount of heavy lifting and just got rid of it. Like, that's great. Yeah. Like, because as remote sensing people, we all know that there's a lot going on in the background there yeah. that is astonishingly hard. Um, that uh, needs an astonishing amount of compute. So I, I, I can't fathom how much effort has gone into that. Yes. I, I think it's tremendous, but you still need the expertise. With, and, and again, it comes back to that idea of top line value and, and being pushed up the value chain. Like now you just get earth observation person who's like, oh, NDVI here, 
And it's like, <laughs> it's yeah. like whoa, that's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Because it used to be that that was quite a hard thing, not a hard thing to do, but you know, there'd be elements of complexity in, yeah. in, in doing that. And now you're just like, oh, NDVI, the world, and show me all the water bodies on Earth. And you could, <laughs> you could technically do that from your phone. Yeah, I, it, I mean, it's it, that's kind of amazing. Um, so all you're left with as as geospatial expert is to think of the stuff which is of value to your community. Now, yeah. obviously, um, it's not necessarily being allowed to be accessed commercially. And yeah. there is like historical sort of turning on and off of different uh, different technologies within that environment. Geospatial community got a little bit burned by Maps Engine being just switched off. That mm -hmm, was, mm -hmm. so, so there's some like history, like yeah. business history there. Yeah, but yeah. on a technical level, amazing. Um, I, I, I would love to be able to emulate that. We, uh, I mean, it turns out Google's got a lot of resources. Available. Yeah, um, yeah, I heard that as well. <laughs> yeah, as, as I understand it, but I, but, but you know, something for us to aspire to, um, and yeah. for Earth observation um, uh, scientists, practitioners, I think, I, I, and for those people who are going to be building out uh, that climate change policy, the, that that's a really important toolkit, and and I'm glad that toolkit exists, um, and I'm glad it's in the hands of those people who are going to be making decisions about our planet's future and making decisions about uh, that, that sort of pertain to climate change policy. And, and so I think that stuff's really, really important. So yeah, it's a, it's a great toolkit. Cool. I do want to finish on, on one last question. I'm going to try something different here, but I, I, I love when people ask this question. Do you have any like cool books or, or anything like, um, uh, I don't know, even an audiobook, a podcast episode or a documentary, just something that comes to mind that, that you've gone over recently and that you thought was interesting, like a blog post or, or whatever. I, I just find this question so interesting. And so I want to ask it as well. Uh, I've been reading a couple of books. Um, I'm trying to understand finance better. So I'm, okay. I'm reading the wisdom of finance right now. It's kind of interesting. Um, but I, I'm also a big science fiction fan. So uh, recently... Like I would recommend people to read June. I think that's yeah. interesting. And I'd recommend people read Foundation, uh, okay. as well as Foundation, because like the classics. Yeah, yeah. But, but, well, I, I think they're important. Um, I think they're I think they're really interesting. I think they're really important. Uh, Foundation because it's this notion of um, knowledge being the pivotal pivotal again um, being <laughs> the the central. Um, a differentiator between societies. And I think that's a really important notion. So those people who hold knowledge can, and I think this is, I think we, I think we can see this in our society now, those people who hold knowledge, those people who hold knowledge of technology, um, providing enormous value to other communities um, around them to the extent that they're sort of, a, you know, galactic differentiator. But I think, so I think that notion is really interesting. Um, the notion of prescience as uh, described in June is really interesting because that is machine learning and that is what we're all working towards. And as a geospatial community, that is, we have an access to enormous amounts of training data if we bother ourselves to actually go and collect <laughs> um, enormous amounts of training data. And I argue that the, I think the killer app for geospatial is probably the future. It's, it's being able to say, this is likely to happen there. And being able to make that kind of assertion, I, one, I, I don't think we're that far away from it. And okay. two, if there's any community that can do it, I think it's ours. And three, okay. if there's anything that a business person wants to know, it's what's about to happen. <laughs> because there's some because really scary really stuff different. that comes with that yeah. question uh, about right. absolutely um but yeah. but yeah I, I i i i love your answer thanks thanks i think we can well, I mean, uh, we can I mean, but but but, but, but but think about it in terms of, of of just simplicity there is a fire on that steep slope there is going to be a landslide next oh yeah that kind of stuff yes 
I was thinking, I, you know, we, Minority Report kind of. <laughs> I, I, well, yeah, I, I think we're away from that. But um, but but like, no, the, yes, like I agree. obvious geographic questions that we all know in our own minds, like we understand that process, but we're not going through the motions of of making that intellectual leap from, oh, this is what's going to happen in my mind to programmatically demonstrating that this place is is at risk and yes. therefore no that makes insurance sense. rates will fluctuate and, and all that kind of stuff that's that's what i'm asserting so no crazy dystopian uh like no uh civilization just yet i'm i'm star trek not star wars okay cool good not bad yeah <laughs> yeah well thanks a lot i think we can end it up uh here uh thanks a lot for everything this this was a, a great conversation appreciate it it's a, a pleasure thanks for inviting me on hopefully it was useful <laughs> well, it was for me. <laughs> yeah.